Ready to go? All right, welcome everybody. First meeting of the year for uh, first regular board meeting for uh, Metro Sacramento Metro, uh, Metropolitan Fire District. Um, it's Thursday, January 12th, 6 p.m. when this meeting is starting. Um, we want to call this meeting to order. Board clerk, would you do the roll call, please? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. I will begin with Director Sailors. Present. Gould. Present. Weber. Present. Sheets. Present. Wood. Present. Rice. Present. Costa. Present. And Director Jones is absent this evening. President Clark, turning it over to you. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is the Pledge to the Flag. Director Sheets, would you lead us on the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the public stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, we have a Metro Cable announcement. The open session meeting is video, uh, videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14. Replay on Sunday, January 15th at 12 noon and Monday, January 16th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. Webcast at Metro 14 Live dot sat county dot gov uh we have the next is the public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within the district jurisdiction including items on or not on the agenda so do we have any speakers we have no speakers in our audience this evening and art if you could allow our virtual audience attendees so you now have the ability to unmute yourself if there's anything you'd like to present to the board at this time okay thank you and uh, I forgot to mention, I hope everyone had a happy new year. So, okay, the next uh, item on the agenda is uh, we have the uh, consent agenda. Um, everyone in the board has had a chance to check it out. Do we have any questions? No. I'll entertain a motion to, uh, to approve the consent agenda. So moved. We have a second by Director uh, Rice and we have a second by Director Wood. Board Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Director Sailors. Aye. Gould. Aye. Weber. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Wood. Aye. Rice. Aye. Costa. Aye. And Clark. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have a presentation item, and this would be the Explorer program, and that would be uh, that my Deputy Chief. Mitchell and firefighter Mike, I mean White, I'm sorry. Thank you, President Clark. Good evening, directors, chief, and everybody here in the audience. Adam Mitchell, deputy chief of operations. Um, I'm gonna be brief because the people that uh, did all the work to get this program to where it is today are here in the audience as well as standing behind me. Um, a lot of work has gone in to get us to where we are at this point today with this new partnership that we're gonna be presenting to you tonight. Um, really, I'd like to focus on three things from my perspective on where the value comes for this program. The first part is the value to the folks out there in the community and adults going through the program, providing them job skills, work development skills that will provide for their success on into the future through this program, which is a really big value for them. Secondly, for us here at Metro Fire, it addresses the board strategic plan on recruitment, retention, diversity, and some of those items. And so um, this partnership really is a win-win for both us as well as Del Campo and the San Juan Unified School District at large past that. So really uh, very beneficial to both. And then third, I know Firefighter White will address it. It also saves lives. We did a presentation here a couple of board meetings ago about one of the students that was in this program performing CPR with um, on their uh, parent and a successful outcome. So not only will it help us grow our, our future workforce and footsteps to Metro Fire, it's gonna help us um, do that out in the community as well. I will say personally, um, I was a student uh, firefighter um, through, I got a little bit later than these folks are when I was at the university. 
Um, and that's really what drove me to figure out how to get into the fire service. And so I think this is another one of those steps in that direction. So I am happy to bring up Firefighter White to talk about what he really has done along with our partners out here, retired engineer Scott Schneider and others, to get us to where we have a fire explorer program manual as well as a contract to be able to do this together. So without further ado, Firefighter White. Thanks, Chief. Uh, good evening, President Clark, members of the board, Chief Haverty and staff. Uh, I'm Tim White, firefighter and our recruitment coordinator here at Metro Fire. Um, I would like to start by welcoming our guests from San Juan Unified. Uh, tonight we have uh, uh, Superintendent uh, Melissa Bassanelli, uh, Director Brett Wolf, CTE Counselor uh, Cindy Penvera, and Del Campos Fire Tech uh, Chief Scott Schneider, uh, retired engineer with Metro Fire. A few weeks ago, Metro Fire and San Juan Unified School District entered into an agreement that has created a Fire Explorer ride along program here at Metro Fire. I'm going to take a moment to talk about the ins and outs of the program, talk about what's been happening over uh, at Del Campo High School, and maybe try to brag a little bit about what the community leaders in this room are accomplishing through this partnership. San Juan Unified School District, uh, one of the seven school dist districts within uh, Metro Fire, sorry, I'm going to try and I'll move around. I apologize. Um, one of the seven school districts within our borders. It is uh, the largest and probably has uh, the most uh, direct impact on our citizens. Uh, it goes through divisions two, three, five, six, seven, and eight, Metro Fire Boards. Uh, division serving uh, about 40,000 students, uh, eight high schools. All eight high school students um, or all high school students from those eight schools are eligible to transfer into the CTE programs. That's the way uh, CTE works. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. This is, I'm going to try and be brief about the history of CTE. We know it as ROP. This is an extension of regional occupational program. Uh, that mission has been going on for a long time, but it really got organized. It sounds like around 1967. 1978, retired <clears throat> fire captain Roy Cameron likes to remind me that he was in the first regional fire ROP class. Um, he's still serving the citizens today through uh, uh, his work as a reserve deputy with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. Uh, on here, uh, Perkins Act and some of these dates are just some of the influential uh, uh, funding opportunities that the school district takes advantage of uh, to facilitate some of these programs. Um, in 2017-18, with the work of some of our retired staff, uh, uh, namely retired AC uh, Randy Hine and Director Gould, with the help of uh, Director Brett Wolf, uh, we're working on a rebirth of the program. Uh, in 2018, they brought Scott Schneider onto the team, uh, and he brings with them uh, the expertise and uh, the absolute passion for this profession that we all uh, remember that nothing's changed about Scotty in, in that realm, and they're uh, extremely fortunate to have him. Uh, this program now has moved from, again, if you use the old ROP model, from a very awareness level, this is the fire service, let's teach you a little bit about it, uh, and has taken leaps and bounds towards operational readiness. Uh, case in point, the Cameron Pascal uh, opportunity, or when he did CPR, successful CPR on his father, um, one of the members that's at Lauren a couple of days ago and a tree fell during the wind event, uh, had the situational awareness through what, he, what she's learned in Scott's class to evacuate her neighbors when they identified that there was a gas leak. Uh, there was another student, um, Wolfgang Stover, that cleared an airway obstruction, a legitimate airway obstruction while attending high school uh, at Del Campo High. Uh, they have worked towards establishing industry relatable uh, certification. They get multiple certifications, including ICS series, uh, HASMAP Pro, and obviously CPR. By the time they're done with their class, they have been dual enrolled or articulated or involved in classes that gain them college credits through ARC, uh, through that partnership that they have there. And probably the most valuable is the experience and mentorship, the guidance, the career guidance that they get from an industry professional, and that's Chief Schneider. Uh, in 2021, um, San, Juan, uh, San Juan's investment in a new CTE building over at Del Campo High School became operational. Uh, I know that some of the board members and the chiefs have seen that facility. It's a pretty incredible training facility and an excellent opportunity uh, for these students. Now it brings us to today in 2023, what our job in this is to provide these young people with uh, on the job training, with the job shadowing experience uh, that will begin in a little more than a week. 
this is what that program looks like. There will be up to 25 students uh, in our fire stations working with volunteer mentors. These are people that have been trained and volunteered to be a part of this uh, process. They have to accomplish over the course of the semester 108 hours of ride along time, uh, as well as some more hours on Friday, checking back in with Chief Schneider. The uh, hours of operation will be Monday through Friday from eight in the morning till eight in the evening, uh, coordinated from with the crew and uh, the student themselves. Uh, once the list is established, uh, Chief Schneider and I will work on matching uh, students uh, at an appropriate station with an appropriate crew for them. Emergency scenes will be observational only for our explorers and all curriculum uh, will be coming from the school district. Uh, that means uh, with some input from us, but uh, the task book, uh, the daily evaluations, although there's something that we've seen, we're utilizing some Metro Fire documents, if this is something we've seen before, but it all comes from the school. They will be getting uh, school credit for this time. Uh, manipulative exercises will be limited to what they've trained on in the fire academy or at Del Campo uh, uh, Fire Tech. Uh, in, in that Explorer task book. And uh, we will make a peer support member available to the program as a resource to add to uh, what the school district already provides their students to take care of their safety and well-being. Program benefits, uh, early mentorship and training. I'd like to read a letter. Luke's here, he's letting me read a letter that his mom wrote uh, to give kudos to the school. Dear Cindy and Chief, I wanted to say thank you and express to you what the Fire Control Tech program at, D at Del Campo High School has done for my son, Luke. This exemplary program has allowed Luke to learn by doing, work as a team, find a purpose, and understand the skills and characteristic one needs to serve his community as a firefighter. This has resulted in him earning higher grades and allowed him to take more practical steps in striving for a positive future. Luke now has his sights set his sights on attending American River College next year and setting goals to pursue a firefighting career. With many of his friends going away to four-year university next year, I worried that Luke might feel left out. Now that he has a meaningful prospect because of this program, he is excited about attending junior college to advance his education. As a byproduct, I have also noticed that he seems to do his chores more, good for you, uh, <laughs> around the house without being asked, and overall has a more positive attitude. Through your... The, through your program that sets high expectations, increases students' knowledge and skills, creates camaraderie and offers support, and offers support, excuse me. This program has turned Luke around to understand that college is actually for him too. Thank you for your support and working with all of the students. Best wishes for a happy and healthy holiday, Sarah. Uh, that says it better than I ever could about what's been, what's being done over there with Scott's program. Observational experience can lead to when they're when they're riding along with us, it can set realistic career expectations for a young person. Uh, it's not Chicago Fire, and we're going to let them know that they're going to see it, uh, and hopefully that leads to increased job satisfaction and young people really having a direction of where they're going to go. That real world experience also provides a more prepared workforce for our training staff. We recognize that sometimes a, a new paramedic or a new AMT's first call is the first call that they run as an employee. Being, having the opportunity to observe for a semester and watch with uh, no obligations to respond and step in or react, I, I think would, is going to be nothing but beneficial to these young people as they further their career. Uh, a diverse workforce that directly reflects our community, a community that is informed about fire and emergency services, regardless of where these young people end up, they will have significantly higher than an awareness level of what their fire service does for them, and they, they take that story with them. This is also building a partnership with our local educators towards mutual workforce development goals. We all want the best for our young people, we want the best for our workforce moving forward. And there's nothing but good things I think that are, that's gonna come out of uh, this partnership. We're gonna gain more than future employees. We're gonna gain a better route to secure those employees. Uh, that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions for me. Any questions? I do. Okay, your turn. First and foremost, um, uh, Captain Cameron, incorrect, I was. I was a ROP in 1976 uh, at a Castro Robo High School. So. <laughs> 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 Secondly, you mentioned uh, manipulative skills and uh, 
So what are some of the examples? Are they going to be on hose lines eventually, saws? What, what are they going to be doing eventually? Not operationally, in training, absolutely. They have a task book that, that reflects a probationary firefighter's uh, task book. They stretch hoses. They have a burn prop at the station. They do SCBAs. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the students is very proud that she absolutely destroyed me in a SCBA uh, donning procedure. She put her mask on, pack on in 36 seconds. So I remember 36 seconds because that's the very best best anyone in 05-1 ever did in our academy. So <laughs> sure it wasn't me. Uh, things along those lines. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Comments? Oh, Director Rice. Um, it might be to Scott too. Um, really excited about the program and the young people that I see out there and the partnership. And I, I would ask as we as we go forward as Metro Fire and I would wholeheartedly support it. There's a fire department in Southern California that has a very active Explorer program, Chula Vista Fire. They're about a 200 member department. And the young people that join their Explorer program in high school, if they complete the program, the, the reward at the end of that is, is a job. And I would you know, really like to see this type of a program be a pipeline into Metro Fire. Um, it's not gonna be easy. Um, and it's not going to be 18 graduate and into the fire service. There's probably more development there. And Scott, you probably have a lot more into this than I do. And if I'm behind the eight ball, I, I apologize for that. But I really would like to see a pipeline for young people in our community to come onto this job here at Metro Fire. And I, I'm all in. So keep, keep, keep it up. And if there's something there that you're already doing that I don't know, I really want to be supportive of it. And I'd like to see us. Um, bring some of these kids on the job. Yeah, so Director Rice, great point. Um, that is something we've talked about. Obviously, the, the, we're talking about the footsteps and we're crawl, walk, run. Um, what we've gone in the last year plus has been a very, very a big uphill battle to get here. Not battle, but there's a lot of work that's gone into it. Um, that is absolutely our goal. And, and I know there's no other examples that you mentioned from California. We've talked about some from Georgia. They have the same process to get there. Let's not we go would, to Georgia. No, we're, we're not California, <laughs> but they're across the nation. There are those and we've looked at them. And so the plan would be the longer term strategy would be that footsteps to Metro fire has us with those folks from our community to represent our community and the diversity and, and bring them through to work for us here at Metro fire and the partnership is that step to get there. But that is our long term strategic plan. It, it's achievable. There are models and there are other models. How many people here knew that the city of Los Angeles fire department has a hand crew? Not many of us know that, and there, there are tie-ins all over to build that work ethic, to help young people mature. I hope we explore all of them. I hope um, when we do that, we don't take, take 10 years to get there. And um, if we got to push the ball forward and have the battle, I'm all in. Perfect. Well, thank you for the support. Yeah. Director Costa. Yeah, just a couple quick comments. One, nicely done. Great presentation. A lot of great information. So thank you for taking the time. You mentioned the young man's mother that sent the letters, the young man here. Yeah, Luke. Can you stand up, Luke? You mind if you stand up really quick? Nothing more important to make your mom happy, so good job. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, nicely done, though. That's great work. Great work. And it shows the work you guys are doing. So my question to you is, what do you need from this board? I know we talked a little bit about you know, the comments you made, but what do you need from this board? So, Director Cross, thank you for that, that question. And I, that's that um, as we're building the strategic plan to address exactly what Director Rice had mentioned is the growth from here. Higher education institutions, we mentioned ARC and Director Gould being a part of that. What those partnerships look like to continue that pathway from high school into some of those her medicine, EMT. Um, we mentioned the dual enrollment, getting some credits, getting some of those folks into that, but also being part of that as far as Metro Fire helping foster that and then all the way through. And so we look forward to bringing some more things to get your assistance in. Um, it's really just taking form now on what that looks like, but the growth and the focus on our, our recruitment arm of our agency is where we're, we've started that, but really, really dedicating the amount of, of workforce that it's gonna take to grow it from here is, is gonna be integral to that success. Great, great. I look forward to this board leaning in to, to help you guys. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't have a question but i have a comment um chief mitchell uh firefighter white uh, thank you for this presentation um i had an opportunity to go and uh, check out the correct te technical education program over at Del campo high school scott snyder 
big ups to you. That's uh, you're you're doing a hell of a job over there. Uh, and uh, it gave me a, the tour. I was really impressed with the program. It's a great program, and and I'm. Um, I think it's a it's a great benefit to the community. Um, I can't say enough about it. And thanks to Director Gould, you know he's he's been involved in that program also. Kudos to him also. And uh, th no, this is just a great program for for our kids coming up. And hey, let's let's keep it going. The great program. That's all I can say. And and also thanks to the uh, San Juan uh, District the educators and all that for sponsoring programs like that, because it's, it's just amazing. It's an amazing program. It, I, I recommend it to anyone to go down there. I was surprised. I was shocked. Like, you know, these kids were like really learning to be firefighters. I mean, and, and it's just, like I said, Snyder, Scott has done a great job in, in putting this thing together because he's had to do a lot of, uh, you know, wheeling and dealing and begging and whatnot. And hey, we, we're all behind you, brother. Relentless. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Thank you. Oh, Director Gould has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I kind of wonder why we don't have Scott Snyder come up and say a few words about the program. That's that he's right. Been so passionate <laughs> about. Right. We talk a lot about him, but he sits there, and uh, I'd like to have him come up and say a few words about things that he believes Metro Fire can do to continue to support him and the San Juan Unified School District. That's a good point. Would you come up, please, <laughs> Scott? <laughs> Happy to do it. <laughs> Scott, Scott, you certainly you certainly didn't think for a moment you were going to get away with not addressing <laughs> I, this I audience. I kind of thought I had an arrangement, but thank you. Not uh, happening. <laughs> Thank you, President Clark, uh, board members, Chief Haverty, and staff uh, for having Del Campo High School Fire Tech uh, here tonight. We greatly appreciate your time and your support thus far. <coughs> um, Director Gould is correct. We are looking and hoping for continued support through Metro Fire. Uh, you guys have already supported us in many ways. We got a donation of uh, Metro Fire turnouts, all our old fire gear turnouts. Uh, we're donating to our program, and it really gave us a jump start. Um, we kind of had a late start in the program in terms of when I came on board and when school started. So we had a big hole to fill. Uh, Metro stepped in right away, filled that need. Uh, and then we've had a tremendous support from San Juan Unified in terms of um, really kind of going outside the box to get some funding, uh, provided some outside the box equipment. You have to understand from a school district's perspective, this is a pretty big ask, right? To go from sort of a fire department perspective to an educational perspective asking for things like fire engines and burn props and stuff like that is a little outside the box for the school district. They've been tremendously supportive. Uh, uh, my uh, CTE director, Brett Wolf, uh, my CTE counselor staff here have done an awesome job, superintendents, everyone sort of uh, expanding their comfort zone, going outside and helping us out to build this program. Uh, there's significant financial support for this program. We have a brand new CTE facility. We have a fire engine side, we have Plymo event, we have SCBAs, we have forcible entry, extrication tools. Uh, obviously we have the turnouts donated by you guys. We have sets of SCBAs. So we've been very, very fortunate. Um, the thing that we cannot replicate, no matter how many props we buy and how many tools we bring to the classroom, what we can't uh, replicate is that experience out in the field. And that's really the main thing we're looking for <laughs> Metro Fire is that experience. Give these kids an opportunity to go out in the field, see what it's like. Is this really going to be for me? Is this something I want to dedicate my, the rest of my life to doing? And that's what you guys can provide. Uh, furthermore, uh, Director Rice mentioned some sort of sort of expanding the program, if you will, in terms of I'm familiar with the programs at Chula Vista, LA County. Uh, I've been in contact with Marietta Valley High School, who has their own program. And yes, they all sort of build to... Um, ultimately a job in the fire service. We're, we're trying to uh, crawl before we can walk, so to speak. Uh, so we're still trying to figure out what that's really gonna look like. But yes, that would be my goal. One of our, our goals for the program and for CTE is to truly provide our students a pathway from high school to college and into career. And truly a pathway. The, one of the ways we can do that, of course, is through uh, what uh, Director Rice has suggested, and that is some sort of transition. They would complete our program and be eligible to take uh, another explorer type program through the fire department, get a little additional training, and then maybe provide them some benefit to some extra incentives, some points, something like that, a guaranteed 
um, interviews, something like that, to give them an opportunity to get hired. So uh, we're looking for support in that regard. Also, um, some logistical support. We have already received some logistical support, but just going forward, as you can probably imagine, 75 high school students chewing through fire equipment uh, at a pretty high rate. So uh, SCBA repair, turnout repair, um, you know, even wearing through boots, that kind of thing, hoses, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can sort of be kept in mind when it comes time to turn over new gear or uh, turn over into new gear and get rid of the old gear, maybe something like that. So, um, and also the mentorship. The mentorship is a huge portion in my mind. One of the main things we're trying to do for these students is, yes, we're trying to give them firefighting skills and EMS skills, but more than anything, we're trying to develop them to good young people, mm -hmm. right? So that mentorship component, that Metro Fire employee who's gonna take that student under their wing say, hey, you got to stay out of trouble. You got to, I mean, it's it's all encompassing mentorship program. At least that's my vision. Not just, hey, here's how you pull a hose. Yeah, you got to cross leg. Good job. Check it off. More all encompassing to raise good students, good young people. And I think that's uh, invaluable, at least in my mind. And that's sort of my goal is to develop good young people. We can teach anyone to pull a hose or take a blood pressure later. We got to get them to the point where we can do that. So. Any Nicely done. Real, real quick, and, and Scott, number one, it's really good to see you. It's good really to see you good as well. You. But it is, as I sit and listen, and we have we have the leaders in the room from San Juan. Um, as luck would have it, there are two major labor unions in this state that have very aggressive and very successful apprenticeship programs. And one is the California Building Trades, Ooh. and the other is the um, California Joint Apprenticeship Committee, of which I'm the labor chair. Ooh. I think that we need to have an offline discussion about is there a way and, and having Dr. Gould here as a director too is a very big deal with his connection at Los Rios. Is there a way or is it time to consider um, our apprenticing to go, you know, it's it's right now it's it's you're on the job, you get apprentice, but I wonder if we need to have a discussion at least to see where it goes in a bigger format. Can that apprenticing begin? at a, um, a younger age and in a, in a younger school setting. And it is beneficial not only to, um, at, at our level now, Los Rios Community College District and the other college districts that are, are involved, but it's, it's very beneficial to the men and women that are part of it. And I will connect with you um, and have a couple of staff people. I think it'll be worth the discussion. It, it might be no at the end of the day, but I think we have to have it. I'd love that opportunity and to sort of address one of your questions. One of the things we're doing, we have some opportunities to reach out to seventh and eighth graders and they come yes. and do tours. We have an opportunity to go there. And so we're trying to get them even younger. That's where we start. Uh, you know, unfortunately, um, some of our young people are getting trouble even younger than we might imagine. And so getting that message out there that one of the first things you have to do is stay out of trouble. Um, we're trying to we're trying to implement that in our program as well. And it's a great opportunity for our students to be mentors to someone younger than them. So great leadership opportunity, we think, and they've uh, really stepped up to the plate. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware or not, but um, my students have helped uh, do some Metro Fire, uh, like the air show and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, so they can represent the department. And we're looking to expand that as well. Um, so those are some of the things we're working on. Amazing job you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? OK. We'll move on to um, action item. This is our next item on the agenda. And this is uh, regarding a surplus property that we have on Oak Avenue. And what the recommendation is to declare the vacant 1.7 acre site as surplus and authorize the fire chief to begin the disposition process. And for that presentation, I mean, we have a um, Jeff Fry, he's our chief, chief development officer. Jeff, you're up. Thank you, President Clark, and uh, good evening. That's very difficult to follow. That was a great presentation, uh, and it uh, brings down mine a little bit, but we're going to try anyways. Uh, a couple of new faces on the dais. Let me formally introduce myself. My name is Jeff Fry, Chief Development Officer for the district. Um, we're going to do this a little different tonight. Uh, in line with some of the objectives in the board strategic plan, uh, trying to move that direction, uh, a couple of note first is integrating uh, data 
and technology into our operational decision making paradigm and then using information uh, from the operations piece to inform our financial decisions, uh, which is the second piece. The third piece being more transparency, openness, and awareness for our citizens that we serve. So in light of that, this presentation to you see today is a combination of those three objectives and can be posted on a website, which is openly available and interactive um, so that folks can see what we're doing, how we think about these type of opportunities. So with that, I'm gonna turn this part of the presentation, uh, presentation over to uh, Aaron Castleberry, our administrative uh, analyst. Uh, one of our newer hires, a part of the team is Jake Whelan, our GIS data analyst, who brought the technical skills to be able to do something like this. And then uh, we'll go through the presentation. I'll come up with a couple of final thoughts. So I, at that point in time, I'll turn it over to Jake. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, directors. Um, tonight, we are here to discuss the future steps uh, for a district on property on Oak Avenue in Orangevale. You can see on your screen here an aerial shot. Uh, the site in question is actually a two parcel property, which was deeded to the district um, when it merged with uh, Sac County Fire in 2000. Sac County had previously acquired the property in 1993 as an intended station location. To date, however, the site has remained undeveloped. The site is actually two vacant parcels totaling about 1.7 acres, and they're currently zoned as agricultural residential. The site is situated close to the Oak Avenue and Hazel Avenue major intersection, and is located in the northeastern corner of the district, district's jurisdiction with South Placer bordering on the north and Folsom Fire bordering on the east. An appraisal completed last September was for approximately 495,000 uh, combined between the two parcels. So in order to determine whether or not a station location here would be operationally necessary, um, we analyze existing response capabilities for the area. Um, on the map here, you'll see the four minute drive time for the surrounding stations, which are station 22, 28, and 29. And as you can see, the four minute drive time here leaves a small pocket of about 3.38 square miles in the northeasternmost corner of the dis district's jurisdiction, which would be outside the four minute drive time. In this pocket area, there were 382 calls for service in the past two years. 20% of those were fire, 76% EMS, and 4% special ops. While the average first um, arriving drive time for those calls was eight minutes, the population density in this area actually requires a 10 minute travel time in accordance with the district's emerging suburban response standard. So when you use a 10 minute drive time instead of a four minute drive time, you can see on the map here that that coverage gap shrinks to less than a quarter mile coverage gap in size. So in this small little area, there were six total calls for service in the past two years, and the average drive time for those calls was 14 minutes. Parcel data for the area reflects this is a rural environment, and the current population based on records is estimated to be about 100 for this small area. Based on the district's response standards, this area is actually considered rural and would require rural response, which would be 14 minutes. So as you can see, um, we are currently meeting that without any coverage gaps when you apply a 14 minute drive time. Um, let's see. On top of the coverage provided by our own stations, 22, 28, and 29, we also, um, Folsom Fire's closest station is well within the 14 minute response as well. Um, we have an automatic aid agreement with them. There's also a South Placer um, station nearby, which we could request through mutual aid. We do not have an automatic aid agreement with them, but we could request that if <coughs> So um, the response analysis that we conducted demonstrated that the district is currently meeting response standards for this area. So an additional station would not be required to meet the existing need. So what about the future need? <laughs> there is no master plan development in this area, nor is there any anticipated changes to population density in this area. 
So that said, our analysis concluded that this Oak Avenue site is not really operationally relevant for us as it would provide redundant coverage to an area that's already well within the district's adopted response standards. Yeah. So thank you. So again, big takeaways here. Um, operationally, we did the analysis. Again, there's nothing in the next 30 year horizon that would suggest anything is going to change. Uh, an important fact here is that we in fact do have automatic aids agreements with both Folsom and South Placer. Was able to confirm with Chief Mitchell yesterday uh, we do have the South Placer uh, automatic aid agreement, so that it just may be a conversation for additional support there through those those channels if we ever have that type of need. Uh, so I'm going to take off the operational hat and put on my portfolio asset manager hat and to say that holding on to vacant land and letting appreciate is great. Um, up until the point, there's two trigger points. A, we need it for operational purposes. It's time to build and go. Or secondarily, uh, from an investment perspective, is when we could put the, the dispositional value of those uh, dollars to a higher and better use, then it's time to pull the trigger. And what that was for me was the Zinfandel project with the allocation of dollars that we had got at $13 million. We think a base price for what we're acting in phase three is, is somewhere between 15 to $23 million for that phase three. So whatever we can do on our end to dispose of these assets so that we know our surplus to make that cash liquid in essence, to be able to fund the more important project, which is the Zinfandel Training Center. We think this is the effective time and an important time to, to uh, start the disposition of these assets and move forward. Uh, so with that, obviously the team is here. We're here to uh, certainly answer any uh, questions about the uh, presentation, any comments? Do we have any to direct the class today? You Thank you. A Great presentation. I really appreciate the technology here because it really paints a picture. So you mentioned you're looking out 30 years at future growth. That's within the district? Uh, that is regionally. When we regionally. look at the planning um, from Sac County, but also Placer County. Okay. And looking at land use plans and all that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's where I was wondering if we looked at Placer County. So regionally, we look at growth patterns in the two counties, specifically where this is located, and then we make certain Absolutely. determinations. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Jeff, real quick, one, I appreciate the work that you, that you guys did and, and showing it to us in an operational standpoint. I guess my only question, I defer 100% to you guys. Um, are we at a good time to sell with seeing some of the inventories there? I know this is vacant land. Interest rates are, are up there. Is that really going to be a factor for us? Or, or are you saying this is a pull of trigger time? Yeah, and not in land sales. Um, you know, we're still short of house. We have the mandate from the state to build as much as we can. Lots, buildable lots are at a premium. This is the right time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Having no further questions, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. Great presentation from you, from you and your staff. Um, I'll entertain a motion to uh, so to, move for, to to deal with uh, uh, staff recommendation. Director Costa. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. second. Director Costa, uh, we have a motion by Director Costa and a second by Director Sheets. Uh, board clerk, would you call the roll, please? Director Sailors. Aye. Gould. Aye. Weber. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Wood. Aye. Rice. Aye. Costa. Aye. And Clark. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Yeah. This uh, part of the agenda, we're uh, on the reports. Uh, first on the, on the reports is uh, President's report. I have none at this time. Uh, next, I'll go to the Fire Chief's report. Interim Fire Chief uh, Haverty. Welcome. Your first. Thank you, President Clark. I appreciate it. Honorable members of the board, and my esteemed colleagues, and uh, members of the public. My first board meeting tonight. I've been on duty for four days. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to follow a pattern that was uh, something that you're used to to begin with, and then I'm going to deviate a little bit. I'd like to recognize um, some retirees. We first have congratulations to Captain Jason Winter on his retirement on December 20th after 22 years of, of service. And congratulations to Fire Mechanic. Scott Courtney on his retirement on December 30th after 25 years of service. And congratulations to Fire Chief Todd Harms on his retirement on December 31st after six years of service. And 
if he happens to be listening, I, I greatly appreciate his opening uh, the department to me and sharing with me very generously his insights and information that I so needed. I'm appreciative of that. We have some new hires. We'd like to welcome Andy Purcell, who has been hired as a fire mechanic in the fleet division, effective January 3rd. We'd like to welcome Daniel Ortiz Medina, who's been hired as an EMS system technician in the EMS division, also effective January 3rd. And then we'd like to welcome Adam Blitz, who has been hired as a CQI manager in the EMS division, effective uh, January 9th, just, just a few days ago, that's Monday. We have a couple of reassignments. Congratulations to Jason, Captain Jason Cahill for being selected to fill the training day captain assignment effective January 3rd. He helped me today with a video and in the past with the video, he's doing good work. And firefighter paramedic Michael Skaggs was assigned to the mobile integrated health firefighter paramedic position effective on January 2nd of this year. And firefighter paramedic, Danielle Blatch, Blatch, did I destroy that name? Let's go pretty close. Okay. okay. Uh, he's been reassigned uh, from the mobile integrated health firefighter paramedic position to suppression, effective the first of the year in the district. I would like to thank uh, firefighter Blatch for her dedication and commitment while working in the mobile integrated health program. She did a good job. We have recruitments that have been open. And uh, so we have a, uh, for Fire Investigator 2, it's a, an internal and external uh, recruitment. If you're interested, final filing is the 31st of this month by 4 p.m. We have a facilities technician, an internal recruitment. Final filing is uh, the 20th of this month, also at four. An assistant fleet manager is an internal recruitment. Final filing by the 1st of February at 4 p.m. And a fire mechanic, uh, internal recruitment also. Final filing on the 3rd of February at 4. And, and a facilities manager, also an internal recruitment. Final filing at the 1st of February by 4. With so many internal requirements, I'm kind of bolstered that we have you know, good people, strong people to take these positions. That's good to see. So now I'm going to deviate a little bit into my own story. Uh, we had a winter storm uh, of January 7th through the 9th. It ran really kind of Saturday through uh, parts of Monday. We got a lot of uh, publicity on the, on the news to be a, a really bad storm, the second wave coming through. The first wave on Saturday was, in fact, a really bad storm, a, a wind and rain event almost like no other. We had a DOC, a, a Department Operations Center activation. You might not be used to hearing that. You hear a lot about an EOC, Emergency Operations Center, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a little bit different for a Department Operations Center. Our Department Operations Center, and these can be opened by the police department, by the fire department, by any specific department. You could have a Department of Transportation open one there specific to support the people and the needs of that department, that organization. And that's in fact what we did. It's a, a great way to lean forward to support our field personnel, our operations specifically. This ended on Wednesday morning. So I'd like to, to thank and congratulate Deputy Chiefs Mitchell and Bailey and Wagaman and our division managers, each one who showed up for a meeting at 6 p.m. on Sunday night in the rain and the wind. And our operations chief officers, especially, who just do a fantastic job in the field. Saturday night and Sunday night's storm front, on Saturday night especially, Saturday into Sunday, we had a, an extreme weather event. We had double the call volume at fire dispatch. Lines down, trees down. It was a mess in Sacramento County and over a lot of California. The companies were strapped to the max and were aided by our community risk reduction folks who came in off duty, who helped by staying with downed lines, power lines, for extended periods of time that allowed the engines, the trucks, and the medics to return to the more urgent types of incidents that they needed to go to. 
I can only say the excellent work by our field crews and our staff, our support group, all they did a great job. Um, our department leaders showed true leadership that through those evenings, and I'm exceptionally proud of them. That evening on Sunday night, pretty late, I had a conversation with the city managers of both Rancho Cordova and Citrus Heights. And uh, I don't think I got the city manager out of bed, but I was pretty close to it, I think. Both of them were very appreciative of the department's efforts in addressing the oncoming severe storm event on Sunday night. They're appreciative of Metro Fire and they appreciate the fact that we reached out to them that evening. I'd like to, um, to highlight uh, one particular rescue that didn't take place that weekend, but the weekend before on January 1st at 5.58 a.m. This was a Copter One rescue the hoist named Dillard Rescue. I had a chance to read their after action report yesterday afternoon, and it speaks of nothing less than uh, heroic action by the entire crew. There was an elderly man. They went out for uh, two different rescues that evening on Dillard Road, or excuse me, that morning on Dillard Road. Uh, when they got there, they found um, a pretty dynamic incident with a raging creek floodwaters uh, that we've seen on the news. You've seen some of the catastrophic uh, footages of that. They saw while they were uh, doing a rescue of two or three individuals, an elderly man who was in the water up to his neck. And at that time, he was not even, he, the helicopter had landed. He was not even signaling the helicopter. So his his cognitive ability was greatly diminished at that point. They kept an eye on him. They figured out a way to safely get to him, even though he was underneath some tree overhang, which presents a unique hazard for the helicopter. They went into action. Rescuer went down, got into the water, swam over to him, pulled him out, probably minutes, only minutes before he would have uh, gone under and saved him brought him back, got him on an ambulance or uh, engine company, uh, taking care of him, he was transported. You know, today's news reports that I saw from the LA Times stated that at least 19 people lost their lives in these recent storms. And I am 100% sure that that number would be 20 had not the crew rescued that man from imminent drowning. And I'd like to personally thank Bryce Mitchell and Monty Vanderlandham, and Matt Dargan, and Brian Kahn, and Christian Gessler. They did a great job that evening. They should make all of us proud with their work. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for them. <laughs> Next subject, I know, you know, in speaking with you, that there's a great concern among many parts of our department and, and among you over workers' comp compensation and and how it's helping our employees who have suffered an injury. I've heard from you individually, board members, about your own concerns as well. And I'd like to share with you all that we have begun an initial effort at examining the workers' compensation program and process from stem to stern, identifying all of the elements and decision points within the overall system. Doing that will help lead us to be able to examine the workers' compensation process and stages to best determine where we can have direct influence, where we can have indirect influence, and where the law, in fact, prohibits any influence from us uh, to make a change, at least in the near term. We're undertaking this effort to make improvements for our membership, how they access information, how they feel about how their department cares about them individually. So I look forward to working with my colleagues in the department, with Vice President Cole on this, and you to help our people who serve this community selflessly. The Chief Bailey and his staff in our Human Resources Division would like to come before you at your first meeting in February to present to you their findings and an action plan which would be to date at that point. So please know that they're preparing an RFP for our third party administrator contract, which should be ready to be released in about two weeks or so. 
it's an important element for you and for me, for our members and uh, for all concerned. I know also that you've been waiting to see the classification and compensation study. Well, again, Chief Bailey is uh, just about ready to go with that. We'd like to reserve a place on your next board meeting, January 26th, to make a presentation of that to you. So you'll have something to work on. A few days ago, we heard from uh, the media and directly from the governor on his proposed budget. The governor's preliminary budget recommendation, it includes funding delays, some reductions, fund shifts, and some uh, triggered reductions as a way to help stabilize the projected $22.5 billion shortfall in uh, the state. I'd like to introduce and bring back Jeff Fry, uh, director of our, uh, our uh, work in this area, and have him introduce a great help that we have as well. Jeff, please. Thanks, Chief, for giving a little bit of time on the topic. Just we know this is an important project for all of us, um, and there is a lot of work on this uh, to get the funding for the next phase of Zemedel. We have heard rumors uh, through backdoor channels that. Uh, the funding for the project could be at jeopardy uh, based on the latest news from the governor in the proposed budget. Uh, Director Sailors and Chief Haverty had scheduled a meeting to follow up with um, Director Gillarducci to see if we can get any additional information that wasn't available at that time. Um, so just trying to bring back to light how important this project is. Uh, Kyle McDonald is now working with us on a lot of our intergovernmental affairs issues at the federal and state level, had reached out to some of the Sacramento delegation that had originally supported the project, just to re re reiterate how important this is. And if they had any information to suggest that our particular project uh, would in fact be cut from the, the proposed budget. We don't have any more information than just what I have told you here. And then the information we have provided uh, in the email to you earlier, um, but again, as we get updates and have the inform information, we will certainly keep you up to date. Uh, we're trying to kick around what's the next steps uh, to make sure this is top of mind. And we'd like to re-engage with 522, who's instrumental in helping us do this, um, and some of uh, you that were involved. So just wanted to give you a quick update where we are. Um, happy to take any questions. Kyle has a lot of details because he's been down at the Capitol. Uh, but again, early awareness to a potential issue. Thank you, Jeff. I just have two more items here and I'll be done. Next, when you know them, a teacher as well. And I can't resist uh, providing you with some training and education on some topics that are quite important to all of us. So for your January 26th meeting, we've arranged to give you an opportunity to hear and learn about the Brown Act and some other topics that will help us with our meetings and with our responsibilities and with our unity as a governance and leadership team. We'll do those, uh, maybe start at, I think uh, we started at five, three, start at three, three to five on that day. So we would invite you uh, on the 26th. Yeah. So we'd invite you, especially our new members. I'd love to have you there so you can hear firsthand the, you know, the rules and regulations of the law that we all have to abide by. Um, and so uh, that will be the first uh, series on that. Yeah. Uh, Lastly, uh, today, President Clark and I met and I we talked about the frequency of my regular communication to you, which I know is of interest. And, and I suggested that I provide to you a regular Friday Fire Chiefs brief. Uh, it's likely to look like or sound like something like tonight's meeting, but hopefully a little bit, or tonight's report a little bit shorter, perhaps. It's also going to include a table. Uh, that uh, Chief Mitchell will provide us illustrating our field staffing for that week that you today receive each day. And additionally, I will communicate with you beyond that whenever we have a major event or any significant injury amongst any member of our membership. And uh, that concludes my report, sir. Thank you. Do you have any questions of the Chief? Chief, uh, I'd like to circle back to uh, uh, work on for just a second. Um, in your deep dive, is there any plan to ask our third party administrator how many claims have uh, treatment plans have been denied? How many 
multiple appeals have been made and then independent medical reviews. Is that going to be part of your deep dive as far as uh, yeah, not only part of that, but also part of some performance objectives in our RFP as well or in the contract. So it's kind of a twofold answer to you, sir, but uh, the first answer is yes. Okay. And then second question I have is we evaluate everything and anything in the fire service. Is there any exit plan for individuals that come back to work uh, from a work comp injury? such as a survey to let all of us let you know how that process worked for them and if not maybe we could look at that as far as implementing that program yeah you know today i don't i don't know honestly if we have anything like that today but we talked about that this afternoon with chief Bailey and hr and again uh, i recommended that that be part of uh, our performance objectives so that um, we get a, a customer survey, right? A satisfaction survey, whether that's done once a month, once a quarter, you know, once every six months at a minimum. Um, but that would be part of our uh, performance objective so that we can see, you know, what kind of quality our third party administrator is giving, not from us, not from our eyes, right. but from the people who actually are using that. Yeah. Thank Thanks. You. Both good ideas. Thank you. Any other questions? Do we, Chief, as we as we look into that, can we look at fire service is very unique in that when a person goes out on injury or illness, they have to be replaced. And any work comp third party administrator or company that administers our, our process, it is in our best interest to get our members evaluated, treated, and back to work. And have, can we look at, and I'll just I I because I feel it. How much money has Sedwick cost us in wages in replacement by not um, having our members treated in a timely manner? And the second part of that is, is I did my heart good to hear that we have an RFP going out. That is a very big deal. We need to treat our firefighters as athletes. When they get injured, they get seen, they get evaluated and a treatment course starts. And one of the things that the third party administrators, we can never let them forget, this isn't their money. I'm probably the only person in this room in probably 1983, maybe 84, at the old then American River Fire District, three stations, six stations, John Jenkins, Gordon Baker, Chuck O'Neill, um, I'm getting old, I forget the names, but it was when we went to a self-insured workers' comp program, meaning we got out of the state fund. This is our district's taxpayers' money. And we need to make sure that whoever administers our program don't use terms like, you're gonna get stuck with, or you're gonna own this. And, and we better make sure that whoever does, I want these folks using our members' names, in their ranks they earned that and they've been injured or ill in the line of duty and, and i'm very passionate about this we can do better and i like what i've heard it does it really makes me feel better um, about what i'm going to see um, i i will make myself available for any kind of an rfp process evaluation um, but the men and women that work here deserve better than this group not 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 the department but this third party administrator has given in my short time here, when we were settling a cancer case that's nine years old and cancer is presumptive, something's wrong. And maybe there's little things in there here and there, but um, I was one of the writers of um, 1127 and, and the new way of doing business in work comp. So I have a little bit of experience with what it's going to mean in those are the things that are going to make us in a, as an employer or a fire department stand up and stand out about everybody else. When this agency gets their members in, gets them treated, gets them back to work in a timely fashion, that word gets around. People want to work here. And it's going to be these little things that's going to set us apart in the future that make people come to us to, to have employment here. So I, I, Chief, I appreciate it very, very much. And, um, I'll, do, I'll continue to pay attention. And as a board member, anything I can do to push that ball forward in this arena, I, I, I will do it. This is so important. Thanks. 
Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you, Chief. That was a great report. Uh, next, we go on to operations report, and that's uh, Deputy Chief Mitchell. Thank you again, President Clark. Good evening again. Uh, some items from operations, um, as you probably saw as you came in tonight um, and felt the uh, buzz over there, our orientation for Fire Academy 23-1 is occurring right across the hallway over the MTC. Um, we will start next week with 14 recruits. Uh, you probably feel the uh, nerves in the building and it's all coming from that room over there. And we're happy to have those folks starting the Academy of Fantastic World Cadre is ready to take them through that training. Um, it's been a while since we last met. We've had 11,661 incidents um, since December 8th. That is an average of 333 calls per day, which is quite a bit higher than what we have been seeing over the last few months when you get my reports. Um, we have fortunately seen a bit of a decrease in overall fire incidents, but we've had some serious fires that have occurred. So um, we have been down to about seven calls a day. Um, an incident to highlight on January 2nd, 10 days ago, engine 117 and medic 41 responded to a medical aid call. Uh, while on scene, engine 117, Captain Jeff Taylor overheard another incident be being dispatched for an unresponsive person with engine 41 in their first due. Captain Taylor quickly realized medic 41 was going to be a closer unit to engine 41's incident and recognizing the serious of it, he made the decision to divert medic 41 to the unresponsive patient that was reported in that other first in. Um, with that one quick decision, an ALS unit arrived on scene just three minutes after the initial 911 call was received at the dispatch location. Medic 41 and firefighter paramedics Andrew Shantz and Nicholas Muhaberic arrived and found a pulseless and apneic person in their 30s with bystanders performing CPR. Within one minute after arriving on scene, the patient was intubated and mm -hmm. ventilations were performed using a bag valve mask. Within two minutes after arriving on scene, the patient was cardioverted and returned to a normal heart rhythm. Not only does this case reinforce the need for early recognition, early CPR, early defibrillation, but also how a quick decision uh, made by our company officer led to a very positive outcome. Medic 41's patient maintained solid vital signs throughout the transport all the way to the hospital and is now recovering in the ICU, I'm happy to report. Great job by our members. Uh, USAR update, um, we recently added nine additional members um, to the task force to replace some of the folks that had moved on from those positions bringing the total back up to 36 members from Metro Fire now participating on Task Force 7. We have several classes, including a mobilization exercise, canine handler and heavy equipment rigging specialist being planned for 2023, um, all hosted by Task Force 7 as well. And then finally, uh, that task force is scheduled to be first up in the West in the months of February and November this year. So um, very good uh, participation in that amongst the 11 or so agencies involved. And I'm happy to say that we have the most participation um, right behind Sacramento Fire Department um, for how many members we have on the team. So, and then lastly, uh, for the storms that uh, Chief Haverty mentioned, um, just some comparison on December 31st, back in 2021 on that date, we ran 307 calls for service. Um, and this year on that same date, we ran 522 calls for service. So that was the first storm. That was a 70% increase of calls on that one date over New Year's Eve. On January 8th, uh, back last year, we ran 340 calls for service. This year, we ran 704 incidents, so over 107% increase in call volume over those two dates. Obviously, as Chief Haverty mentioned, the Department of Operations Center was activated as a result of that. Our members did a phenomenal job. I couldn't be more proud of those folks out in the field, as well as our day staff that came and supported us. Incredible to see the district step up in the way that they did to really focus on our service delivery and meet our mission. It was absolutely um, awe-inspiring. So really, really great job there. Um, and then finally, we worked with Cal OES, to, uh, the operations chiefs in the county, to pre-position some resources um, through the uh, state budget that allows for pre-positioning. Um, and we brought in the Sacramento, Sacramento uh, Regional Incident Management Team. Both of our helicopters were staffed um, moving forward. Uh, we had a swift water rescue team type one, a type three strike team that came in, as well as a rescue company. Um, and we continue to this day to have that presence in the Sacramento County EOC and working with our partners in Sacramento OES to make sure that we get all the way through this recovery period. So and with that, unless there's any questions, that's the end of my report tonight. Do we have any questions for <clears throat> No. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report, uh, Chief. Next, we have our administrative report. I don't see uh, Deputy Chief Bailey up, uh, up there, so we'll just have to. Chief Bailey is preparing for a medical procedure tomorrow. He's unavailable tonight. But okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay. Next, um, finally, we, uh, under uh, the fire chief's report, we have a, a support services report from uh, Deputy Chief Wagman. Uh, good evening, President Clark, Chief Haverty, Board of Directors. My name is Tyler Wagman, Deputy Chief of Support Services. Uh, first off, I would like to thank uh, Chief Haverty uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak on behalf of the Support Services Division. Uh, I will periodically give you updates uh, on the uh, divisions that work within this branch. Uh, and provide accolades, uh, well-deserved accolades for the many folks that work within the support services branch. Uh, so within the for support services branch, uh, I am distinctly honored uh, to serve numerous men and women uh, within the fleet division, the facilities division, the communications division, logistics division, our purchasing division, our community risk reduction group, our fire investigations unit, and I also serve as your board of director over the Sacramento Regional Fire Emergency Communications Center. Over the next several board meetings, I will first highlight each one of these divisions and give an opportunity for our managers and our assistant managers uh, to say hello to you and introduce themselves. Uh, and then after that, um, further down the road, I will provide some summaries of these divisions and provide you some highlights uh, as we continue to move forward. But tonight, I'm gonna to highlight the communications division. And this division works extremely hard with keeping the wheels on the wagon, if you will, installing radios, mobile data computers, emergency lighting and sirens in over 300 vehicles throughout the district. They help and maintain our radio system, our 800 megahertz radio system uh, that is operated by the Sacramento Regional Radio System in the County of Sacramento, as well as provide up-to-date information in our computer-aided dispatch system. They handle all of our station alerting equipment at all 40 fire stations, as well as maintain many other devices and equipment that helps the district answer the public's call when they're asking for us to go to work. So without further ado, I, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, the division manager of the communications division, Steve Jordan. President, directors, uh, Chief Haverty and, and staff. Thank you, as Chief Wagon mentioned, I'm Steve Jordan. I'm your communications manager. Uh, I have nearly uh, 20 years of experience in the support services side of the fire de departments, the last five and a half being here with, with Metro Fire. And it is a great, uh, great department. Uh, I have the privilege of working with two, out, two amazing uh, communication technicians, uh, James Day and Alex Waibara who are uh, very responsive to the needs of operations and committed to the success of Metro Fire's ability to provide uh, outstanding service delivery to the public. So one example that I will highlight them uh, with was this recent um, activation of the D DOC. Uh, right after Sunday evening's um, uh, briefing, I, I immediately called them to let them know of the situation and told them, hey, just be ready. Okay, be ready to respond if needed. And a few moments later, I, I drove out to the shop to get some needed equipment. And without telling them, they were already there at the shop, preparing equipment, getting things ready to go just in case uh, we needed them. So just speaking uh, highly of, of their ability and their foresight uh, to take action. And they spent the next uh, couple of days uh, going throughout all of the stations to make sure uh, the communication related equipment was functional and, and working correctly so the guys can receive those uh, calls for service so uh thanks for the opportunity to come in and introduce myself uh briefly and uh if anybody has any questions i'll i'll take them do we have any questions no thank you thank you thank you chief thank you uh, next on the agenda is we have the metro fires Local 22 liaison, that would be Battalion Chief Matt Cole of Local 522. He's a vice president also. And I also would like to recognize the president of Local 522, uh, Trevor Jamison, sitting right up front. Thank you, President Clark. Good evening, members of the board. Chief Haverty, welcome to your first board meeting. Um, thank you for recognizing the retired members. Uh, we'd like to thank Scott Courtney and um, Jason Winter for their service of good union members and, and providing protection to the community. And welcome those new members to the organization as well. It's exciting to hear about all the recruitments that are taking place and the fact that we have new recruits. 
uh, get ready to join the fire academy just across the hall over there. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank our peer support committee for putting together uh, what was a pretty powerful presentation earlier uh, this week, the, the Boyd Street incident. Um, Captain Aguera came up from LA City. He, I don't know if you recall, but there was um, a fire situation in a commercial building that resulted in a, a pretty traumatic incident where multiple LA, fi uh, LA City firefighters went to the hospital with significant burns. Um, and not only were there, I think, 17 significant injuries that he had listed, but countless injuries that they could not see. So he came and talked about the impact of that incident uh, on the organization. And we had 250 members at the Crest Theater downtown regionally um, that were able to hear that. So thank you to Ryan and Freddie, the peer support group, and obviously Trevor for supporting that presentation to all of our members. Um, I really want to thank Tim for his uh, presentation and, and Scotty for everything that they're doing. Um, we're really excited to support this program. We have 35 men and women who have volunteered to be these mentors. And um, like Tim said, and, and Scott had said both, like it's, it's really about giving that coaching and opportunity to develop these young people. We can teach anybody to, to bang ladders and stretch hose and put band-aids on, but we can't teach them how to be good people. We can show them the path and encourage them. And so catching folks early, um, we're really excited to be part of that. So thank you for allowing us to be part of that. And thank you for your support and asking what else we can do. And as far as the men and women on the workforce side, we are all in on helping develop those coming behind us. Um, I myself was part of Explorers and ROP, and I don't know that everybody would consider me a success story, but here I am. <laughs> so, no wonder you turned out to work. Well, thank you. I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. I don't know that that's unanimous across the board, but um, I do believe that I, I would not be here without being involved in those programs. And I, I, I commend this next step of that, because when I knocked on that door, fortunately, I knew some folks in the fire service because I had some family. But showing up at a firehouse with just one of these blue shirts on and not knowing anybody and hoping that you bought the right donuts and that you don't sit in the wrong chair, that's really, really stressful. Um, so now we're going to have somebody take those folks under their wing and show them the way. And that is, I think, such a strong evolution of that program. So thank you very much and thank you for supporting it. Um, Similarly, I want to thank Tim for uh, the Q&A that was put together in here. Yesterday, we had over 100 members, that, not members, 100 candidates who want to join our organization. I thank you for your support in um, sort of reestablishing our Metro Medic program and what that's going to mean to our service delivery and EMS and what we saw started as a small circle and then expanded into this weird oval and then this crazy octagon. And actually, we had candidates sitting in all of your chairs. So hopefully I didn't leave a mess back there. But this room was packed that, that want to join uh, with folks that want to join this organization. And, and I think that's a testament to the hard work that we did towards the close of 2022 to make that a good union job where people can come support their families. As I'm thinking about this career development and that, and that path, there's no reason why these young folks can't get put into a six-month program where they become EMTs to be able to deliver that level of care and slide into our, our, our medic program. Um, and then we can continue to train and educate them and build partnerships with colleges and CJAC. And so we, we did a good job getting that moving forward. And yesterday was a, an exciting culmination of those efforts. We had two deputy chiefs in the room, multiple assistant chiefs, battalion chiefs, and we broke into small groups and answered all kinds of crazy questions. But the energy in the room was very palpable. So thank you for that, Tim, too. And thank you again for your support that allowed us to get that contract in place to do those things. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Chief Lozano. I don't know if he's still here. He was here a bit ago. Um, we have an opportunity to, through our partnership with CJAC, the men and women in the organization do training every day. We log that, which brings some reimbursement uh, through a, a labor relationship to, to, to provide funding to the organization to do good things, to increase training opportunities and potential. We have a partner uh, in the Bay Area that was looking to unload some extrication equipment for pennies on the dollar. And then we worked together to use CJAC funds to, to secure those things. So we're going to be able to do some extrication classes and keep companies in service and really expand our ability to protect our community at a really high level, and bring other folks in to join us. So I just wanted to, to reference that that CJAC partnership is strong and, and we, we plan to continue to strengthen that and do good stuff. And this is a really good example early on in 2023 of doing that. And then to the, to the, to the storm coverage uh, points that, that um, both Chief Haverty and Chief, Chief Mitchell had made, and, and even to Chief Wagman's point here with Steve coming up talking about, it, it really takes a village 
for us to be able to do what we have done over the past couple of weeks. Um, it doesn't surprise me that we got national recognition for the service that we provide because it, it's not just about the last two weeks, it's about the 10 years before that and really busting our humps and training and preparing whether it's air operations, whether it's our ambulances going all over the place, making sure that people are getting to the hospitals, battalion chiefs staying on wires down so engines and trucks can clear, and crews staying, staying out until 4.30 in the morning, cutting limbs and bucking things up and helping people get back into their homes. That's what we do. Um, and so I'm proud to represent those folks. Uh, I know that all, all of you are, are proud of the work that they do, and, and I appreciate all the recognition. It's not just represented, it's everybody, it's everybody who is part of this lift on behalf of your communities. So thank you and thank you for, for speaking to that, all of you. Um, <clears throat> and so we still have some challenges, like the storm will pass, but the storm that we're, we're gonna continue to face is the impact in, in the pre-hospital care and the hospital care and, and the wall times today at, at one of our local facilities, we had 14 ambulances backed up. We, our, our drawdown was significant. I know we're still working together on that, I'm really hopeful that through, um, through our county representatives and our LEMSA, we can start to establish some, some things together to where we can free those companies up and make sure we're still able to get sick people to the hospital. I know that the hospitals don't want to impact us like they do, but we're going to have to continue to really kind of shake the tree and see what falls out so that we can ensure that we get resources on the road. Until we come up with a long-term fix, we need people here so we can put more resources in there so that we can cover the hospital six by having just more ambulances. And the 100 people that were in this room represent that opportunity. The fact that we deployed our first BLS ambulance yesterday, though we don't want to reduce services, we will always provide advanced life support and that level of care to put BLS cars out there and have our first responders ensure that we're providing ALS care is going to be a big part of bridging that gap. And we saw the people here that want to help us do that. So um, we're excited to, to hopefully expedite that recruiting process, onboard those folks, get them here, get them on the road, get them out into your neighborhoods until we can figure out a long-term fix. And that's pretty much all I got, unless you have any questions. Great report. Uh, any questions? I've got it. Okay, go ahead. Please. Sorry, it's not a question for you, but I'm going to bring it over to the chief. If that's okay on the yes, wall sir. time component. Um, I'm still learning, but do we meet regularly with the hospitals? Not only do we meet regularly with them, but we have what's called EMS 24, which is a field officer that goes to the emergency department to try and uh, encourage in many different ways mm -hmm. them to move patients into areas of the hospital that they can. Okay. At a higher level, yeah, there's a, there's a, a few different ways that those meetings take place. The answer is, is yes. Um, both at the tactical level within the emergency departments themselves, um, as well as the strategic level with the hospital administration. Okay. And so we presented, I'm assuming, some short term fixes and then kind of the long term vision. Okay. And meetings on the docket, but I haven't okay. had one yet. In okay. Those first I know few you. Days. Yeah. Welcome to your first meeting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You bet. Director Rice. Thank you. Just and probably maybe Chief um, Mitchell and, and then Vice President Cole. Just curious on the reception of um, fielding a BLS unit. Um, was it effective? Do you think it's going to um, meet the projections that that we're thinking on service? And I, it's a long time coming. I, it's I, I like hearing that just a little bit more. Yeah, and also, Director Rice, thanks, Matt. Appreciate that, Vice President Cole. So um, we did a lot of work on the forefront. Obviously, you know we've never had a BLS unit on the 911 side in the system months and months of work, working closely with 522 on figuring out how to do the dispatching, what's the protocols, we updated policies, we did a lot of those things. And also part of that is uh, as we went through the squad deployment that we did last year was to make sure our regional partners had some buy-in and ownership of that. And so part of what the work was on the back side of, of getting this out in the, in the system being regional, we talked to them about it and they were very, very supportive. I will tell you the LEMSA was very supportive and interested, and they've since added a position That's to do BLS coordination. And so they recognize it. And really, it's kind of 
that sounds like a great idea. You guys try it and then we'll follow up with how we're going to do it in the county, which we're fine with that because as we talked about, we have a need out there in the community to be able to provide higher levels or more levels of service while we figure out what long-term EMS fixes we can do. So from the membership side, we put it out and, and our EMS um, service delivery team was integral working together to build the system and build the program, make recommendations where we put it and all those things. So um, I know that there's probably some folks out there that aren't quite sure how it's going to work out. It's been open for two days now. We did see on day one some very positive, you know, some responses and things that worked out well. However, there was wall time impacts for those members as well. Um, but yeah, I think overall we've done our due diligence in getting the system built for it. We're going to try it out. It's a minimum of a 60 day pilot period as we go through this next round of hiring to make sure we get good data. Um, behind doing the pilot program, but all of our regional partners, uh, LEMSA, like I said, has been very supportive. I'll leave it with, for Matt for the 522 perspective from the membership, but I think overall it's been a very positive thing to push the system in a way that really we haven't done since the early 70s with Johnny Good. Roy and those types of things. So. Yeah, so Director S, I visited multiple firehouses today that ran with that BLS unit just to touch base, and, and the response was really positive. There's still some concern like how is this going to go what's that going to look like similar to the squad deployment but the squad deployment was with this in mind we've been working closely together with that service delivery model to look at what modernizing our deployment looks like as a whole and when chief mitchell talks about the wall time the benefit there is that the squad was on the wall those two individuals that were on that squad technically would have been on an ambulance had we not shifted the staffing to the squad so we were still able to deploy als care when it was a critical call the folks on the squad were there to maintain that care and we didn't take engine 24 out of service to ride in with them. So those are good examples of what we plan to see and projected at that level of service to be able to put BLS ambulances out there. And, and as we work together and, and look at the standards of coverage, that's the kind of data that we need. And so the, the, the men and women on the floor were excited to see that actually work because we've been talking about it since I don't know, March. Since I was <laughs> Last here. March. Yeah, well, yeah. And and great. so and yeah. the priority there is not to jeopardize patient outcomes. We still will always provide the highest level of care. We understand the challenges at the hospital. And and honestly, like I think that everybody that works at the hospital wants first responders out there getting sick people, their family members, they want to get to the hospital too. This is not a, a call out of anybody. We are this is just the reality of the situation we're in. And the men and women in the firehouses that I talked to yesterday said it ran a lot of calls. It helped. Had we not been able to deploy a BLS ambulance, we would have had one less ambulance yesterday. And all of those calls that it picked up would have gone to somebody else that would have been stuck on the wall. So it's it's a good use case. We're just a hot minute into it, but we're going to use this to expand and modernize our plan. Exciting. Thank Very you. Much so. Thanks, Chief. Any other questions? We're good. Uh, no other okay. questions? Thank you, Chief Cole. Thank you. Great job. Okay, next item, uh, we're going to go, we're going to go to committee and delegate reports. Um, executive committee, uh, they met today, we met today and did some uh, assignments for uh, vacancies that we had open for committees. We had a vacancy open on the finance committee and Director Weber is nominated and approved for that, that uh, uh, position. Uh, we had a policy committee, was, we had one vacancy and Director Sailors has taken that position. And then uh, Citrus Heights two by two uh, committee, uh, Director Weber was appointed to that because that's, that's his jurisdiction to begin with. And finally, we had uh, the Sacramento Co uh, County two by two committee. There's an alternate vacancy and Director Sailors will serve uh, that committee. Um, we didn't have any other uh, requests that I had. And so that's that's uh, basically what we, we talked about. That was done. That will be referred to the, to the, uh, the board itself, the full board. Um, next, we have the uh, Communication Center JPA. That's uh, DC Wagaman, Deputy Chief Wagaman. Dave Chavez, directors. Uh, good evening once again. Uh, the uh, JPA board uh, last met on Tuesday, January 10th, here at the uh, Metro Board Chambers at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, in attendance, we had Assistant Chief Williams from the Sacramento City Fire Department, uh, AC Wilson from Folsom Fire, 
uh, DC Quiggle from Consume This Fire and myself. Uh, we had three action items that morning. The first was the approval of 290 hours for GIS services through uh, AXM services that was unanimously approved. Uh, Chief Wilson was elected uh, and accepted a position as the board chair for 2023 that was unanimously approved. And the vice chair position uh, was accepted by AC Williams, the Sacramento City Fire Department also unanimously approved. We did have a discussion item uh, and when that was to move back to uh, two meetings per month. Last year, we moved to a single meeting uh, as a trial. Uh, we noticed throughout the year that there were some struggles on the administrative side of the house was getting things pushed through in a timely fashion. So we're gonna move to, uh, back to a meeting on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month, starting uh, in the beginning of February. Um, I would like to dovetail on the storm talks um, and give some much needed recognition to our dispatch center. Uh, when all heck was breaking loose, uh, I too jumped in my vehicle and drove as fast as I could to the dispatch center, a whopping 25 miles an hour as I'm dodging trees and unknowingly driving over power lines. And it was, it was a mess. It was a disaster. At the same time, I'm listening over the radio that our CAD system is going down. Uh, these things happen, um, especially, and if they're going to happen, this is when it's going to happen. Uh, but we've learned our lesson over the last few years. There are contingencies put in place. There were additional dispatchers put on. They have processes that they go through. The backup generators that we invested in worked because they too were out of power. But as I'm driving there, I'm thinking to myself, what tools can I pull out of my toolbox to help calm this chaos? And that's all I thought about all the way there. And when I got there, I was relieved to be greeted at the front door by their operations manager, Julie Todd, talking in a very calm voice. She told me what the issues were. She told me how they were resolving them. She told, what, she told me what contingencies that were being put in place. Um, we had an assistant chief and a battalion chief there assisting as well. And we had representatives from other agencies showing up also. The system was working. As much as things were beyond chaotic on the drive there, when I was on the inside of the building, it was anything but chaotic. It was actually very weird. I expected for them to be chaotic and answering these calls that make really the 4th of July look like child's play, but it was just incredibly calm. And that just speaks to the professionalism and the preparation that they have gone through year after year after year. So my hat goes off to the men and women that work at our dispatch center for answering the call and pushing those calls out. There's one other thing that I distinctly remember when I walked in, and that was somebody's snacks, a full bag of snacks sitting on one of their one of their consoles. And I knew the minute that I saw that, that that person wasn't going to touch those snacks that night, let alone get lunch, let alone a bathroom break, because they were going to work for 12 hours straight to make sure that every call gets pushed out of that dispatch center. And they did that night and on into the next day and the day after that. So uh, strong work for the leadership for Chief Bear and his staff over there. Outstanding job for our dispatch center. And I wanted to recognize them here tonight. Our next uh, meeting, uh, we will be meeting on February 14th here at Metro Fire Fort Chambers, nine o'clock in the morning. And that concludes my report, unless you have any questions for me. Do, uh, do we have any questions? I have a question. I just uh, wanted to thank you for um, the site visit. Um, I too was very impressed uh, with all of the dispatchers that I had the privilege to me and uh, and Julie as well. Um, you know, uh, I think about um, when I left there, some of the, uh, you know, uh, events that they must, um, you know, hear that is, it, for me, when I'm seeing it, I'm in it and that sort of stuff, but they don't see it, they hear it. And I can't even imagine some of the things that they probably heard that night. So thank you for recognizing them and thank you for the uh, hospitality, it was a great visit. Uh, ditto to, before you leave, Chief, ditto to uh, what uh, Director Sheets just said. I had an opportunity to visit the center also, and those people are amazing. I don't know how they go home at night and just, they probably have to calm themselves down because it is one thing after the next, and, they, and they're very proficient. They're amazing. They're amazing. Great asset to, to the Metro Fire. Thank you. Well, I thank you right also for, the, for allowing me to visit the, the center. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Next, we go to the Finance and Audit Committee, and that would be Director Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We uh, the Finance and Audit Committee has not met since our last meeting. 
We are scheduled to meet again January 26th at 5.30 in this room. Thank you. Next is the policy committee. The eloquent uh, <laughs> Director Gould. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, luckily, I've been demoted from the policy committee, and that group will uh, select a new chairperson, and they will have their first meeting on February 9th of 2023. That ends my report. Oh, thank you, Director Gould. That, that, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that demotion, but <laughs> all right. And next, we have board member uh, questions and comments. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dirk Acosta. All right, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, just a couple things. Um, one, I'd like to thank, I know we talked a lot about the storm response, um, but it was, it was amazing to see, not just on the news, but I had the opportunity to go to all the stations and luckily not get in the way. Um, but just stop by and see all the great work. Um, and there was significant impact in Division 9. Um, but I mean, I, it, was, it was just amazing to see. And actually, one station I stopped by, I stopped by a couple of times, no one ever came back. Um, and that was because they were just on calls after call after call. Um, and it was just, it was great to see and, and made me proud um, to be a director and be here in support of the team. So thank you for all that you do. And I know... Um, everyone really appreciates you when they call, but it's nothing like being out in the cold, in the wind, and just dealing with the hazards of the environment, but doing so in a professional manner. So thank you. Um, and second, I had the opportunity to sit down with um, Director White. We've talked a couple times um, and I had an opportunity to grab lunch with him and, and spend a couple hours really just learning from him um, and getting some advice from him. And um, it was great because he he really wants to contribute to not just the district, but to the community. Um, and we found some great opportunities to do that. And I look forward to continuing to work with him. And we talked about trying to get together at least on a you know, quarterly basis to just, you know, what's happening out there and how can we work together to make, make a difference for the community. Um, and he reminded me that, you know, now I work for him as a resident. And so uh, I look forward to doing that. Um, but I just want to thank him for his, his time and his professionalism. I mean, it couldn't have been a nicer person. And it really was an opportunity for us to just work for the community. Um, and on that note, you know, I, I have a lot to learn. Um, I don't know what I don't know. So please bear with me as I ask questions, um, but I have a lot to give. So I just ask that, you know, staff, board, please lean on me. Um, I wanna see this organization move forward in the future. And I think we have some great opportunities. We can only do that, you know, working together. And I really want staff to just lean on this board. I'm gonna continue to ask you, what, what can we do? And I hope you have an answer for us or or direction because I want to make sure we're doing all we can to support you. So thank, thank you. you. And thank I you. actually have one question. <laughs> um, you know, I, as I looked at the staff report, we had um, a plan for, you know, the, the developer fees and how we're going to fund stations as we move forward. Um, I really want to take the time to meet with staff and learn about, you know, how do we, the technology of this used to show us kind of how we're looking at response times, looking at siting. Um, I want to make sure we're looking at everything because there's so much out there, um, not just planned, but there is a lot being discussed as far as growth and not just housing, but the impact on the roadways and those roadways impact our response times. And so I just wanna make, you know, put out there that I wanna meet with staff and really talk through that and um, learn a little bit more about how we're evaluating it. And then again, how I can help. Absolutely. You could go through the chain of command. The chief. Yep. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Director. Uh, next, we. Uh, uh, Director Sailors. Thank you very much, um, President Clark. I would just like to express my appreciation and give everyone at Metro Fire um, my sincere gratitude and thanks for their professionalism and their um, continued um, showing up and working in the worst storms we've seen in many years. They are out there doing it um, and continually just um, continuing to strive for um, best in show. That's what I'm gonna call it, the, the best in show. Um, not only did we have one helicopter out there doing um, uh, saves, but we were flying two helicopters when they needed them. 
Um, I love to see that. And um, when I woke up and I was listening to the radio, I can't help myself. And I heard that 111s was sitting on um, a downed wire on the house since midnight. I drove by just to make sure that they were okay. And um, just checking up on you guys here in my district. Um, and they were fine. They're doing good because they love what they do. And it's that that makes us all the professionals that we are. We love what we do. And I just wanna thank everyone for um, being here and always striving to do the best and to do the right thing. Thank you, that's it for tonight, thank you. Thank you, Director. I guess uh, we all have to, we all should get at one of those radios so we can keep up with that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that, for that year report. Um, Let's go to uh, Derek Weber. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank Tim and his team. Uh, 45 years ago, I, I might've been a troubled youth and without this program and getting me introduced to positive, strong role models, uh, who knows where I might've ended up. So I think that this program was a first step of saving my life. Um, and so it's a it's a good good thing you folks are doing. So you get you folks behind them. You have a great opportunity here. Um, like I said 45 years ago, this happened to me. So good luck. Um, secondly, I want to thank Chief Haverty for uh, the optimism that he has now certainly given myself uh, with what we're discussing with the work comp situation. Um, but I'm already cocked, so I've got to go off on uh, past practices. Um, you know, I wonder if, if these words back here, if they actually mean anything or if they're just fluff. Because we ask all of our members to give 100% all of their time. And when they raise their hand in need of help, it seems like they're either ignored in the past and or mistreated. The challenge that we've had for a very, very long time, and this is mostly for the board, is if you have a work injury, you're automatically treated. You, you have to be treated by the district. Have to. What happens after that is numerous other treatments have to take place and sometimes even surgeries. With the multiple, multiple, multiple denials of treatment plans and work comp, or not work comp, but uh, physical therapy sessions, by denying a individual a physical therapy session that could cost $5,000, we've cost the district $60,000. So that we as a board should certainly take a look at, and that's one case. How many cases out there are they are there? And I know, Chief, you're going to be diving into that. Um, but what kind of monies are we, we throwing away by not treating these individuals and getting them back to work? Every single one of these folks, all they want to do is get back to the best job on the planet. That's it. They just want to get back to work. So I would like to agendaize this item and maybe... Uh, get it to a committee to either work with the chief and his staff. Um, but I think we need to take a, a very deep look at A, where we have been and how we can do better. Because if we do anything at all, in my opinion, it's better than what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Director. Next we go to uh, Director Sheets. Good evening. Uh, I want to congratulate all the retirees, including Chief Farms, and thank him for his uh, years of service and welcome you uh, to your new role. Um, whatever I can do to help, um, please uh, lean on me and I will try to help as much as I can. I do want to welcome Kyle and um, Jake. Um, welcome. Um, the presentation tonight was absolutely incredible. Um, it is um, 
so amazing to see um, young people who are going to be inspired um, because there is that mentorship and uh, because they're going to be given that confidence um, and the tools to be able to be in this amazing profession. So welcome and thank you so much for that. Um, I want to um, extend my gratitude uh, to Captain Mitchell, Monty Van Lenningham, and the rest of the flight crews uh, for the amazing job that they did, including all of the crews that um, were out there in that absolutely horrific um, weather event and the support staff that um, also supported um, making sure that the community that I, that I live in is uh, protected. Um, couldn't be more proud to be a board member, especially seeing it on national news. Um, absolutely incredible. Um, thank you, Chief Wagman, again, for allowing me to uh, visit the comm center. Um, I am looking forward to my first station visit of 2023 at Station 31. Um, and I just want to wish the rest of the, uh, the crews um, that are going to be working this weekend with this another um, <laughs> unprecedented uh, weather event um, to make sure that they're safe and uh, just extend my gratitude. Um, I know that uh, their families are also stressed when they're gone. Uh, so just acknowledging that. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Sure. Next, we'll go to uh, Director Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'll go real quick. Um, it was talked about a little bit that the uh, governor came out with a budget. It's got a $22.5 billion, billion with a B, shortfall. But I think there's a couple of important things there that we should pay attention to as firefighters and statewide response. And in 2021 and 22 alone, the governor put $2.8 billion over four years into wildfire resiliency. He is the first governor in well over 20 years that has invested this kind of money at a state level in wildfire response and resiliency, meaning vegetation management, um, land use planning, and those type of things. And the good part is that right now that budget remains 97% intact. That's important. And that the 3% cut to the fire budget alone is gonna take place um, in programs that are not related to fire suppression. And it's important, why is that important to Metro Fire? Because we're a big participant in the Master Mutual Aid Program. Our men and women are out there all over the state. So it's important that you know that, that this governor um, combined in my lifetime, you can take every governor that has served the state of California and no governor has paid more attention to the fire service than this one. Naturally, he came in with the campfire and the car fire, but it woke him up and he realized that the money has to be placed in there. And it, it, it's the old adage, um, look at your budget and I'll tell you where your priorities are. Look at the fire budget at the state level and you can see where the priorities are for state leadership. Um, over the last three years, the state has increased um, Cal Fire's budget in the area of fire protection, which is um, uh, a very big deal. In 2021, 2022, the budget appropriation was $2.9 billion. And for 2023, 24, the um, appropriation is gonna be $3.4 billion. So the attention and keeping money in fire suppression and fire protection in the state of California is taking place at a statewide level, it's important to us because our men and women that serve this department are going to be out in the field with the, our brothers and sisters in CAL FIRE. So that's one I think that's important for everybody to know. And the other, the other thing, since he's been in office, um, when he came in in 2021, 22, CAL FIRE in total had 88,200 8, positions. Today, they have 9,783 positions. So it's important, to, you gotta look at the whole picture. And what's important to us is, I mean, everything's important, but we're talking about our profession and we're talking about protecting our communities. And it's important to acknowledge that the leader of this state has prioritized fire protection in the state of California and the communities that we represent. We can't ever forget that. Um, the next up, I have a couple of EMS things in the, I hate the acronym APOT, the wall time. Um, I've had a number of meetings um, with my day job with the California Hospital Association CEO, 
we have spent a year working with the statewide EMSA trying to come up with answers. Um, Metro Fire actually was quite a catalyst for that. And um, Chief Harms quite a while back did a throwdown on the hospitals. He delivered cots and, and said, put people on them, I'm getting my people out of here. It made a huge difference. And I think the shock value was necessary but the work is not done. There is uh, one piece of legislation that is being looked at uh, from a Southern California legislator to potentially consider um, uh, fines or having the hospitals pay for standby time. It it's going to be a very interesting conversation. We must be actively involved um, in this conversation. And it, it, it's not going to get better and everybody is stressed out. We can't take it out on our doctors and our nurses that we work with in the ER. It's up higher than that. And it's a very complicated issue. And I think that we all have to work together. We have to be cognizant, but we're beyond a breaking point. And, and now it's an action point. And, and I'm really hoping that we're gonna see some relief at a state level um, in the next 12 months, but it's gonna take all of us, whether it's Metro Fire, it doesn't matter. All of us have to be involved in this and aware. The other one, local EMS, I have a couple of things I've heard, but I don't know this. Is the LEMSA director in Sacramento County close to retirement? Do we know anything? Yes. So the County Board of Supervisors 100% controls EMS delivery and the system in Sacramento County. We as elected members, you as fire administrators, especially high level fire administrators and the union, you have, we have got to have a rock solid relationship with our county board of supervisors. And I was here and I blame myself. I was a chief officer and I was also a union guy. And we got a California Highway Patrol officer as our LEMSA director and every single one of us were asleep at the wheel. It happened and we didn't know. We have got to be active in that arena. We have got to talk to the Board of Supervisors. We have to be active in choosing a LEMSA director because that is what makes the success of our EMS program being able to be innovative, being able to try things that we've never tried before. We have got to have that person there. And if I've missed the, the ball on this one, I've missed the ball, but we've got to be there and present for that. The other one, and I've heard this and I see Chief Law, um, I, I'm sorry, Chief Flower, you are EMS chief or fire prevention? You're a prevention no, person. Fire You're a fire marshal. Who's our chief? Who's our who's our EMS chief? <laughs> and he, he, John's not here. Maybe I can rely on on your expertise, Chief Law. And I, I want to see if it's actually happening. Are departments other than Metro Fire doing rest periods for ambulance crews, medic crews? Is that actually taking place? And if it is, that's not a bad thing. But what I don't wanna see hap happening is Metro Fire Medics crews leaving their jurisdiction to cover that unless we have an agreement in writing that is reciprocal. If, if that is taking place, um, we need to look at that and we need to look hard at it. I, I, I don't have a problem with it because I see the call volume, but it has to be reciprocal. And I can't see a medic unit, whether it's in the city or Folsom or wherever it is, getting a four hour break and a dinner break and the men and women at Medic 101 or Medic 111 are brought into that jurisdiction to run their calls. We need to look at that. Um, when I was here as an employee, um, the city of Folsom very much took advantage of Metro Fire and our medic units. And um, we were able to curtail that and come into a reciprocal program. We always wanna be a good partner, but I'm concerned um, that our medic uh, companies are being impacted here. And they, and if they are, we need to correct that um, and make sure that it's reciprocal. So I really would like to hear if that's taking place. If it's not, my apologies. Don't mean to be accusatory in any sense of the imagination, but I want to make sure our members are in our jurisdiction delivering the service to our communities. So we need to look at that. Um, the last one for me is the California Fire Foundation of which the executive director is Rick Martinez, who is a past fire chief here. We all, most of us know him. We have a program um, through the Fire Foundation called SAVE, Sending Aid to Victims of Emergencies. And it's off the ground, but it's not off the ground. 
And what the SAVE program is, the battalion chiefs currently carry, um, they should have if they've replenished them, they have $250 MasterCards that can be given out to any citizen that has experienced a fire or damage in their home that it is not um, habitable, no strings attached. It takes less than a minute for a captain or a chief officer to activate that card and you can hand that family this isn't going to solve all your problems tonight, but here's $250 that you can get for diapers, for formula, for food tonight, for um, underwear, whatever you need. We have got to get on top of that program. And my challenge would be elected board, local 522, and the appropriate um, chief officer. Let's get that program going. I did a call. We did a fire in my area that um, pretty extensive. I believe six families were displaced. I put a call in just to check, hey, were we able to give out save cards? That's six families that could have been handed $250 to help them through their day. And with the weather related, Chief Martinez is um, working with the new director of OES, Nancy Ward, in establishing a program that we will be able to use that for flood victims if your home is flooded. So we can, there's an MOU, we're in it, we can be creative, but this is absolutely something that we should be giving out those cards on every fire um, to our community, because in turn, that brings community support back to the Metro Fire. And it's just a very important program. I do wanna work hand in hand um, with the local and fire administration to see if we can really get that off of the ground. Um, there's ways that we can do it. We can get it into, we can get them into engine companies. We can keep it at BCs. We're flexible. The whole thing is let's make sure that it's part of our um, strategic tactical planning that we make sure that we can give that relief to um, a homeowner or, or a renter. It, can, it doesn't have to be a homeowner, a renter, an occupant of the building. So that concludes my report. I appreciate all the work that has been done. I appreciate Battalion 7 and Truck 106. They came into my neighborhood and helped a couple of ladies with a tree. And what I liked about it is I think they expected to be asked and you could just look and, and you knew that, you, you knew the expectation was reciprocal, that they, they didn't even flinch. They took care of the problem and they were on to the next one. And I very much appreciate the men and women for, for that professionalism, but service before self. It's not about you. It's, it's not about your badge. It's not about Big Red. It's about the community you serve. And I'm seeing you serve the community and as a, um, an elected official, I really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rice, for your comments. Um, next, we have uh, Director Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just really quickly, want to apologize to Scott. I had no idea that there was a prearranged code of silence, so he was uh, caught <laughs> off guard. Uh, and also, I would like to thank the San Juan Unified School District leadership that's behind Scott in supporting his project. Uh, they have done a great job of supporting him all along, and thank you for, very much for that. That's key to starting or restarting this program, which will be immensely um, popular and successful long term. I'd also like to thank a couple of my colleagues on the board for decisions that they made decades ago that were realized or the benefits of those decisions were realized just a few days ago as some of my colleagues have mentioned watching those helicopters uh, rescue individuals that we heard about tonight uh, those decisions were made like i said uh, 20 years ago and so i'm a appreciative of their standing up and and stepping out of their comfort zones to do that um, that concludes my comments tonight thank you Mr. Chair, running an excellent meeting tonight. Thank you, Director. Uh, uh, Director Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just echo what everyone's already said uh, prior. I do want to add to Firefighter White and to John Schneider, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, it's an excellent presentation, excellent program. And like everyone said before, whatever we can do to help, uh, we need to keep this going and, and keep people getting excited and getting them in there. Um, Chief Mitchell, appreciate the time you took, and Captain um, uh, Wilborn, PIO Wilborn, appreciate the, the effort he did to get information up to me so I can be a part of that blitz. We were out there Saturday morning, January 7th, before all the storms came in, uh, going to a neighborhood um, 
out there on Roseburg Court, um, handing out fire detectors, smoke detectors uh, to neighbor to the community. We had uh, a couple of a truck company, engine company that were out there doing installations for people. Um, and I appreciate uh, BC Gonsalves and Brenda Briggs. Um, and I didn't get her first name, but Nigren. Um, uh, for letting me tag along with them as we went around to the houses and I appreciate their time. And uh, again, like it's already been said, it's just very proud to be part of the people that were there. Um, the, the crews that went in and worked with some of the, these homeowners, these members of our community, getting them um, smoke detectors that they needed. One woman was an elderly woman that we went into and um, she was very emotional. Uh, through the course of talking to her, it turned out that that was the one year anniversary of her husband's death. They had been married 50 years. Um, and uh, BC Gonzalez uh, took time to talk to her. It was quite cold in her house. He wanted to make sure she had heat, that she knew how to operate her thermostat. He just took time, went way above and beyond what he was there for, to make sure that this woman uh, had comfort and care and knew that she was cared about. So uh, it, it's just amazing. Every time I'm I'm with our, our men and women, they always always just exceed whatever wherever I think they are. They're always exceeding that that threshold. Um, lastly, I just want to say January 9th, uh, a couple of days ago, was National Law Enforcement Day, uh, Appreciation Day. Um, this comes just two years after the anniversary of the uh, January 6, 2021 uh, attack on the Capitol. Um, where we had a violent attempt to prevent our constitutionally guaranteed peaceful transfer of power. Those rioters uh, injured 140 of our fellow brothers and sisters, uh, first responders uh, in law enforcement, including 73 from the U.S. Capitol Police Force and 65 from the Metropolitan Police Force. Um, in addition to the injuries, all those injuries, we also lost five officers. Uh, Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick was killed after a chemical agent was used on him. Subsequently, four officers took their own lives. And these are Metropolitan Police Department Officer Jeffrey Smith, Metropolitan Police Department Officer Kyle DeFreitag, Metropolitan Police Department Officer Gunther Hashida, and Capitol Police Officer Howard Liebengood. I just would ask Mr. President in honor and appreciation um, for the courage, dedication of all these officers that defended our Capitol. Uh, and for those that paid the ultimate sacrifice, I just ask that we have a moment uh, of silence for our brothers and sisters in law enforcement. Thank you. Absolutely. We can do that uh, actually before. Uh, well, no, and I German. Yeah. No, you know that when we have closed session, we try to ask most of you to go home, you know. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Conceded. Thank you for that report. Great report. Uh, well, um, what else can I say? Um, I just want to thank uh, everyone for their uh, their comments and their their reports. Um, the one thing I want to talk about, and, and I want to thank uh, the guys from Engine One Hundred and Nine. And this was this happened at December eighteenth. We have a yearly uh, a yearly uh, deal over at the. Uh, um, Ralph Richardson, Star King Elementary School uh, for Christmas. And um, those guys came out, uh, the Engine 109 came out and I wanna thank Captain Tom Koscielny and engineer Dan Zumwalt, firefighter Mike Gall. And uh, the guys, one little incident that happened that was really cute that uh, we had Santa out there. We have a, we do it in cooperation with, uh, with the Central Labor Council and, we have one of the guys play Santa Claus all the time. And there was this little girl. She was just, she was just a mess. And, and, uh, <laughs> and it, was, it was Santa Claus. She didn't want anything to do with Santa Claus. But the minute we put her on that fire truck, that little girl calmed down and her mother said, she said, she just loves the fire trucks and she loves the firefighters. <laughs> it was funny because Santa was there trying to, you know, play Santa Claus. And she was like, oh, I don't want to do with you. I just want to get on a fire truck. <laughs> so anyway, um, haven't, uh, haven't said that, uh, well, everything, all the other comments have been, you know, great comments and uh, thank all our board members for the comments of chief and, and so on. So uh, next thing we're going to do is we're going to, um, we will have that moment of silence before adjournment. Uh, 
uh, Director Wood. And uh, we're gonna adjourn to a uh, closed session right now. If you wanna stay for the moment of silence, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, we those that need a, a break. <laughs> I know, it's been a while. Uh, we'll have a report out from our council, uh, General Labra. All right. Uh, thank you, President Clark. Uh, the board met in closed session. Uh, on conference with legal counsel as set forth in the closed session agenda, no reportable action was taken. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'd like to have a uh, moment of silence for the uh, our fallen heroes in uh, the January 6th insurrection. Meeting is adjourned. The next meeting, uh, the next meeting that we meeting will be on uh, the regular next board meeting would be January 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, anticipated items uh, to be determined. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Good night, everyone. Cheers.